Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining in to hear about the World Development Report 2015. Our title is Mind and Culture. It's a somewhat unusual title for the report, and we think it's also a somewhat distinctive report. Rather than focusing on a sector or on even an economic problem, we're focusing on an approach. That approach that we want to emphasize puts decision making at the heart of development policy and development practice. Recent decades have witnessed an explosion of interesting research in fields such as behavioral economics, psychology, sociology, anthropology. Many of these fields have given us a new understanding of decision making and behavior, and we think it's time to integrate all of this knowledge, much of it which is very promising, and bring it to development policy, development practice, and uh, development theory as well. In many cases, we don't yet have definitive answers to some of the questions, to some of the problems that we face uh, about development as they relate to decision making. But we think that asking the right questions is crucial, and the research is very promising in that regard. Our main uh, contribution, we think, is that a realistic understanding of how people make decisions and how they behave will help us do development uh, much better than we have in the past. Let me now turn to um, a couple of the goals of the report. Our first goal is to change the way we think about economic development by integrating knowledge about decision making that's scattered across several disciplines. That's a mouthful. It obviously refers to the point I just made about recent research, but let me expand that a little bit. Every policy uses and relies on assumptions about human motivation. Sometimes these assumptions are explicit. For instance, we often think that people take action if and only if the benefits of doing so exceed the costs. Something like that was behind the policies we, use, we, you, we uh, have had with regard to user fees for education. The thought is that when there's a small fee for education, people will think about the long-term benefits of education, compare it to the small fee, and still enroll if it's in their interest. At other times, these assumptions in policies are implicit, as in the idea that giving people more choices always makes them better off, or in the idea that people think about land as a commodity, something to be bought and sold the way that we often do, abstracting from the social meanings that adhere in land and, and um, the environment in some instances. Um, as these examples suggest, making these assumptions is not easy. In fact, our assumptions about how other people make decisions are sometimes mistaken. As the economist John Clark said about a century ago, if the policymaker does not examine psychological mindsets, he has to make up his own, and those can be mistaken or misguided. This is so for several reasons. The first reason is that not all people are motivated the same way. People's mindsets vary enormously. There's diversity in terms of the cognitive capacity people have, the capacity for self-control, cultural meanings, orientation towards others and to generosity and altruism, and sophistication about the biases that you have. Policymakers need to abstract about all these things. As the political scientist James Scott said, policymakers typically try to make things legible, understandable, by assuming a kind of uniformity. That has been helpful at times, but as we will argue in the report, that often gets in the way of good policymaking. Second, context matters a lot. So the same person will decide differently if subtle cues, which are typically invisible to the policymaker, are changed. In other words, the diversity I just described is contextual. It doesn't only arise from different types of people, but from different environments. It's often the case that policymakers don't come from the pri that they do come from pri privileged backgrounds and don't understand the context of poverty. And then finally, None of us is all that good at uh, guessing the motivations of people who are different from us or who are far away. For instance, people are often reluctant to ascribe complicated emotions, love, hope, resentment, to outgroups. They typically think that only people close to them are capable of complicated emotions. Many people also believe incorrectly that others are not doing as much strategic thinking as they themselves are. The main thrust of our report will be that we can do better that the research that I just mentioned provides a great deal of understanding about how people actually make decisions, how they behave, how they choose, and we can improve our policies 
by targeting how people actually think, how they actually behave, rather than simply modeling it in a relatively abstract way. That leads then to the second goal, which is to enrich and expand the policymaker's toolkit. If you take this seriously, what this means is that our typical instruments in policymaking, which involve changing prices, providing more information, regulating, now have a psychic depth. We have to think about how people respond to them in, in a variety of settings. For instance, in, in case of prices, as the psychologist Dan Ariely says, zero might be a special price, different than just a couple pennies more. That's important when we think about preventive health, for instance. We think about information. We typically think of that information is about standards um, for the public sector or, or the private sector, uh, performance, um, how good services are, um, outcomes. But other kinds of information are crucial too, such as information about how other people are acting, excuse me, or emotional information. And then finally, regulation also has psychic depth. Regulation and law are not just command and control devices, but they are also expressions of what people, the society believes, which shape norms and shape how people think about themselves and other people. We are going to describe this, though, how those um, tools in the toolkit change in light of a more realistic view of decision making and also talk about new ideas, new approaches that emerge from them. Um, let me emphasize uh, a caveat, which is that this approach won't solve all of our problems of development. A variety of structural issues remain. We still have to worry about prices. We still have to worry about uh, technology. Those are all important, but it does suggest that some problems can be, can be addressed in a very cost-effective way in light of this new understanding. So um, let me tell you a little bit about our main ideas. We have four ideas that we're going to try and put forward. The first is the idea that paying attention is costly. People have limited bandwidth. Economics is the science of scarcity, but we typically don't think about the fact that attention itself is a limited resource, a scarce resource. When we focus and think hard, we, um, our heart rate in, uh, speeds up, um, our pupils dilate. It actually costs biological energy to pay attention. It is scarce. You might think about times when you're trying to multitask. Multitasking itself is a misnomer. You're typically focusing on one thing at a time, but you're jumping back and forth. When you're trying to park a car or find an address uh, in, a, in a car at someone's house, you typically turn down the radio because it's too much information to handle. That's because attention is a scarce resource. Now, what does this mean for development policy? Um, there, the, uh, there are three kinds of policy ideas that this means, that this suggests. The first is that we may want to focus on rules of thumb not making information very complicated. For instance, in financial literacy programs, it's been shown that focusing on main large ideas, the simple rules of thumb is more effective, can be more effective than giving people all the details about how it's supposed to be done, which is how training sometimes works. We can also think about procedural simplification. For, to enroll in a variety of programs, whether it's conditional cash transfers or school or health insurance, we ask people to sign up. When we ask people to sign up, that's not costless. People have to go through that sign-up procedure and that can block the utilization of the services we want and not improve development outcomes in the way that we'd like. Finally, we can think about physical design as a way to um, um, uh, keep in mind that people have uh, limited bandwidth. There's a line, often in many environments, there's a line down the middle of the road uh, to sort of guide you on one side of the street. We can think about those kinds of physical design enhancements to make development policy better. Uh, we can, for instance, do child nutrition either by providing lots of rules to mothers about how to, um, how to provide solids to their kids, or maybe design a bowl, which itself encodes the kind of information we, we want to convey about how much, pro how, many, how much proteins, how much carbohydrates, and how, how many vegetables in it. So those are some thoughts about uh, bandwidth. The second main idea we want to um, emphasize is that there are intention-action divides. Self-control is hard. Many of us want to lose some weight. Some of us want to quit smoking. Most of us want to save more than we do. We have the intention to do it, but something gets in the way. 
some, you know, a new, there's a new sweet, a new dessert that, that's, that's attractive. Uh, the smell of cigarettes prompts us to behave. We might want to save, but oh, there's a new iPod available or an iPhone available, and, and boom. This affects us, but it affects everyone in the world, rich and poor. What does this mean for development policy? There are a few uh, policy ideas that come to mind. The first are commitment devices, and I'll say a word or two about this is, in a minute. This is basically the idea of a lockbox. Uh, you put away your savings, you don't touch it, you're forced not to touch it. We can offer these to people to help them stick to their intentions. The second involves the timing of um, subsidies. Um, sometimes people want to, say, enroll their kids in school, but don't manage to save enough to pay the school fees. If that's the case, maybe we should change the timing of um, transfers, conditional cash transfers for instance, to coincide with the moment right before the school fees have to be paid. So people don't have to wait as, they don't have to hold on to that money for as long. The same might be true about farmers who um, need fertilizer for next year's crop. Maybe we could allow them to purchase the fertilizers and facilitate that purchase right at the time of the harvest when they have some cash rather than waiting until later. We can think about reminders to help people save, to help people um, um, stick to the other actions that they, that they want to follow through on. We can change the default options on, on, on a variety of um, programs so that people are automatically enrolled in something rather than choosing to enroll in it. This has been powerful when it comes to savings programs, for instance. Finally, we can support self-control. Think of it as a, um, uh, a muscle to be uh, strengthened, uh, nurtured, supported by starting at a young age. That's the second idea. The third idea involves social meanings. We see through a cultural lens. When we think about words like honor or government or leader or woman, those vary from culture to culture. We don't get to choose the language we speak in. We don't get to choose the environment in which, into which we are born. And those shape our sense of ourselves, our sense of people around us, and our possibilities. Aspirations matter a lot, so do role models. There are a variety of programs under the broad lens of um, entertainment education in which not just information is conveyed to people, but aspirations, hopes, through soap operas. Um, changing uh, the, who gets to be a leader in a society can provide new role models. Arts and theater can be used. We can use self-affirmation practices to help people. This might sound far out, but it's been shown, for instance, in schools um, in the United States that when, uh, after a two-hour self-affirmation exercise, um, low-performing kids do better in grades two years later. It's quite powerful. We can also change the collective meanings of practices so that certain practices which are um, branded bad uh, become branded as acceptable. Um, female genital cutting and mutilation comes to mind, and there's been work in that regard. Finally. Um, social norms. We think socially. We are fundamentally social beings. Um, we want to cooperate with others. We um, punish others who do not cooperate with us. Uh, there are social emotions, um, disgust, anger, honor that matter a lot for our choices. Um, so the policy ideas here are that information about what others are doing matters a lot, not just about performance, as I mentioned, of, of a certain service provider, but what others choose to do. Um, we can provide information to people about, say, how a school clinic is, um, I mean, a clinic or a school are not doing very well, and people might respond fatalistically and say, well, it's always been that way. But if we tell them, you know, 80% of people around you don't like this, that's a different kind of, different bit of information, and it may be empowering and promote collective action. Um, so those are um, the main ideas in the report. And let me s briefly um, just summarize them very quickly. Paying attention is costly. Self-control is hard. We see through cultural lenses, and we think socially. Now let me provide a couple examples of, uh, of these ideas. First, paying attention is costly. In Kenya, there was a study in which people were given reminders via text, SMS, to take their antiretroviral medication for HIV AIDS. People who received no reminder achieved a high level of drug adherence 40% of the time. People who received a weekly reminder adhered to their drug regimen 53% of the time. That's something we can use, not only in the context of drug adherence, but in the context of savings and other kinds of things we want to get people to do um, 
but which, for some reason or other, they don't find themselves paying attention to. Notice, interestingly, um, the weekly reminder was more effective than the daily reminder, which basically had no impact. The daily reminder apparently was just, became the wallpaper, became background, became something that people didn't focus on at all. This raises, uh, I think this interestingly highlights the point that in this area, we need to think about testing what we do. We may have a hypothesis about the kinds of reminders that'll help people, but we need to actually go out and try it and see what works best in a given context. As I said, we need to think about um, asking the right questions, and we need to be thinking about how people actually make decisions, and we can't assume that our, that our models of it are always accurate. Here's another idea. This is from the great philosopher um, Dilbert. Um, this is Dogbert's retirement planning service. Um, and someone comes in uh, and asks uh, um, and is told that my fee of 10%, my fee is 10% of your portfolio for the year. And they say that sounds reasonable. And someone says, none of my clients understand how the future works. Things can be quite complicated. People don't typically understand portfolio decision making. Many of us also do not. But the general point is that simplification can be important and we should use it, as I mentioned, in a variety of contexts, including program enrollment. Here's an example of what is called a frame. Notice squares A and B. It looks like B is lighter than A. Let's see what happens when we take out that shadow that's being cast by the cylinder. In fact, A and B are the same color. The context matters a lot. It shapes what we pay attention to and what we focus on. How things are presented for us changes how we will behave and how we will choose. When things are presented, for instance, in terms of a loss, we pay attention in a different way when things are presented to us in terms of a potential gain, even though they may be two ways of saying the same thing. This has been shown to motivate teachers in working hard. To, to, to present things in terms of a loss can make a difference. The next point is that self-control is hard. This slide shows you the results of a study involving a medical scheme private health provider in South Africa. This healthcare provider would give people a 25% cash back reward when they purchase healthy foods, whole grains, fresh fruits and vegetables, low fat dairy. Now, a number of people who are subscribers of this health scheme were offered this contract. Would you like to increase the amount of healthy food you purchase by 5% over the next six months? If you fail to do that, we will take away your 25% bonus. 36% of people took up this offer. This in itself is interesting. From a standard, traditional point of view, no one should take up this contract because you can only lose. There's nothing to be gained. There's only a penalty if you fail to meet your target but a third of the people decided it was worth it to them to take it up. Now what happened? You can see that in the green line, the people who committed to this contract increased their share of healthy food. Those who didn't take up this contract, but were offered it, and those who were just told about the general idea that, um, uh, it, might be good, that it might be good to lower your um, uh, unhealthy food consumption, um, they didn't really change their behavior very much. Researchers went back and found that this lasted six months after the program ended. So this is a commitment contract to promote self-control. This, this idea has been used in the context of smoking and in the context of savings as well. Markets typically don't provide this kind of um, commitment contract because most people don't understand that they have a hard time with uh, self-control of this type or if they do understand it, they don't quite get to the point of wanting to sign um, this kind of contract. Uh, a third of the people signed up here. The second reason markets don't provide it is because if they do provide it, if, if one entity, a health scheme, provides it, another entity can come in and undercut that first entity. In this case, even though people weren't, uh, were purchasing more healthy food themselves, those who signed the contract, they, we, they may have been able to purchase unhealthy foods from another source, not using the credit card from the health scheme. Self-control is a challenge, and commitment contracts are one way to um, address that problem. A third idea I want to mention is that we see through a cultural lens. Here's a graph, um, a couple of graphs, um, uh, from um, a paper on climate change. 
people were asked, how much risk do you believe climate change poses to human health, safety, or prosperity? In the left side was the hypothesis. This is the public irrationality thesis. The idea here is that as people become more numerate and more scientifically literate, they're more likely to believe the 97% of scientists who think that climate change is real and caused by human activity. So if we give people more information, things will get better. That's the left side. On the right side is what people actually observed. In fact, there was no relationship between increasing literacy, scientific literacy and numeracy and uh, likelihood and believing of the risk of climate change. The researchers broke this down further and found that actually if you divide this into two types of worldviews, people who are sort of hierarchical and people who are egalitarian, there's a big difference here. And the lack of impact and somewhat declining impact is actually the result of people who um, belong to a particular worldview which they label as hierarchical. So the idea here is that people use their rationality, their numeracy, their scientific literacy, not only to figure out what the truth is, but to express which group they belong to. They belong to a group which does not want to believe this uh, and um, use the infer and discount the information that they receive, even though, um, um, and especially when they are more numerate and more scientifically literate. Cultural lenses, in this case, what the world you have, matter a lot for how we see information. Now this is often described as confirmation bias. Um, here's a cartoon in which the boss comes in and says, take your feet off your desk. And the, the worker says, is this an example of random management or do you think it will make our stock rise? And then the boss says, it's up 0.02%. Heh, heh, heh. Not so random after all. Of course, 0.02% is noise, but we have a tendency to believe, to find evidence that supports our prior views. It's a, uh, it's a phenomenon that affects not just, I mean, obviously, not just people um, who are the, the objects of development policy, but the policymakers themselves, ourselves, and we need to keep in mind that these decision biases affect us too. Another idea of, a, of the importance of culture, exposure to TV role models reduced fertility in Brazil. This graph shows the years after the arrival of O Globo, um, in particular municipalities in Brazil. Um, o Globo was the television station that, that showed a soap opera relating to uh, fertility. And you can see the effect um, after pe when people could watch it in their communities. Now, people, the researchers here attribute it to the soap opera because um, when there was um, O Globo co coverage um, and people could access the soap opera, there were more kids with names of soap opera stars. There were decreases in fertility um, just after episodes with plots about upward mobility. And there were stronger effects for women whose age was close to that of the main character. This raises the general idea of um, entertainment education. This kind of story about the effect of soap operas has been shown in a lot of other contexts as well. And we think it could be useful development policy. Finally, we think socially. This is a picture of a road accident in a collective vehicle in uh, Kenya. Road traffic accidents are among the top 10 causes of death in Kenya. What can reduce them? We might think it's regulation, making things, um, uh, uh, you know, finding people for not wearing seat belts, um, uh, creating a, d a, d a technological device that disables a motor. But of course, sometimes when that happens, people find ways around it. Uh, there are stories that in Kenya, when uh, this device was established that disabled the motor, if, if the vehicle was going too fast, people developed a disabler for the disabler, a governor for their governor, which then made that ineffective. Um, what else can we try? How about a sticker? Uh, th there was a sticker um, put on a bus that reduced bus accidents by 50%. The sticker said, don't just sit there as he drives dangerously, stand up, speak up now. This apparently had the effect of getting people to protest when drivers were driving uh, recklessly, or maybe bus drivers, uh, uh, vehicle drivers who had the sticker on the bus themselves drove more cautiously because they thought other people were now able to stand up. So this changed a social norm, encouraging people to stand up and protest. That's another way in which um, th that, that's a kind of uh, um, policy intervention that we can begin to think about, directly targeting social norms. Um, um, in Uganda, people attributed a, a decline in 35% decline in road accidents to speed bumps. In Bogota, Colombia, um, in the late 90s, people used mimes to encourage people to slow down and to um, not to um, 
to be careful when pedestrians were crossing the road. So those were, the f those were examples of the four main ideas we want to put front and center in this report. So let me leave you now with um, three questions to um, think about. Um, the first is, the first question we should be asking ourselves um, is what are the mindsets of the people policymakers are trying to reach? We should ask questions like, how do people we're trying to reach think that their life destiny depends on their own choices? This is a term that the term that psychologists use is called locus of control. But do people feel in control of their lives? Yes or no? We don't. Some people do, and some people don't, and different people do at different times. Understanding that information can help us design policies because sometimes those policies depend on people making good choices for um, depend on people um, taking control of their lives. Um, we can ask questions about the cultural lenses people use. We can ask questions about the information they have about the beliefs of others and their expectations. And then finally, we can ask questions about how sophisticated they are about their own knowledge of their own biases. We can ask questions about the decision traps that we policymakers might be falling into. We should ask ourselves, are we overly attached to our assumptions? Are we overconfident? Are we looking for information that confirms what we already believe? Um, are we attached to a course of action even though it's going to fail? And finally, how can we systematically, through policy design and regular policy practice, talk about um, the mindsets of others and our own decision traps in a systematic way?